Charles, do you see anybody for public comment? We haven't received mm -hmm. any written comment. I think not. No. Great. Okay. Uh, great. So let's go on to the review of the meeting minutes from August 18th. Um, if someone would move those. I'll move them. Thanks, Doug. See your hand. Leslie will second them. Any comments, changes, amendments? I did not see any. Anything, Leslie? Your eagle eye usually catches something. All right. So all in favor except no, nothing minutes. today. <laughs> okay. All in favor. Hey. Yeah. So that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. So Nels, update on the Green Street project. So Jared Hutter is here to give us a uh, quick update on some developments on the Rothschild mixed use project. They have begun their uh, discussions with oh, there's Charles. Great their discussions with the IDA, but Jared's here to give us a quick update on uh, the project. So thank you, Nels, and thank you, everybody. Um, so there's two quick things just to sort of bring up, and I know you guys have a, a hefty agenda afterwards, so not much discussion, but certainly something to think about, you know, heading into the next meeting or the next time we're able to talk. So number one is we'd like to inform you guys about a tenant that's gonna be occupying a major portion of the front portion of the building. Um, that is going to be Ithaca College. So Ithaca College is working on a new physician's assistant program. It's a brand new graduate school program that they're implementing. Obviously, these are, uh, they turn out to be very high paying jobs. They bring a you know, very high caliber and quality person uh, to the school and to the area. So we've been working closely with Ithaca College for a while now to design a space that is going to work for their needs. So that space is ultimately going to get turned over to them. It's in a portion of the building that is not being redeveloped um, or majorly developed, I should say. That's going to be turned over to them uh, likely right around the first of the year. And they're going to be working on their build out uh, and their timeline. So I think that's obviously a very exciting piece for, uh, for everybody, given that it's a, obviously a great local tenant, a really strong tenant um, that's going to be you know, bringing more people to the area. So that's number one. Um, number two. Excuse me, Jared, um, before you move on to number one, can you sure. just clarify one thing? Um, where, what is in that space right now, the space that IC's new program will occupy? Um, nothing, actually. That is where the massage school used to be. Um, so they're taking the dominant portion of what they're doing is on the second floor. There is a little bit as the, the bottom, the first floor of the building gets reconfigured, they will have some presence on the street level as well. Um, but it's really the bulk of the space that, you know, I don't have the exact percentage, but effectively they're taking the massage school that went out of business. Got it. Thank you. So the second piece is, you know, the affordable housing, which obviously we spoke about, you know, at the last meeting and, you know, something that's, we've struggled with on our side in terms of exactly how to make it work. Um, you know, getting, we know the 20% goal, we're well aware of that. Um, it's just not going to work from a long-term perspective. And as we look at it, we look at two things. Number one is <clears throat> there's a glut of affordable housing that is coming to the area anyway. The neighboring Vecino project that we've been obviously closely coordinating with now for I don't know, six, seven months, that's obviously that entire building is affordable housing. Um, not that there can never be enough affordable housing, but I think that that fills a major need for downtown. Um, so that, that's the first portion of it. The second portion of it is, as Ithaca College takes a piece of the retail, effectively the office space in the front, we're also, part of the reason that they're coming to this, this site and this building is our ability to give them housing on the second, uh, in the, behind it. So we've been looking at and trying to figure out and understand the housing that ultimately may get leased to them, you know, at a very favorable rate, you know, how does that conclude into the affordable housing component that, that is ultimately required, um, whether it's 10% or up to 20%. So that's something we're looking into. We'd like you guys to sort of, you know, get a sense of that as well. But the other piece is, you know, as it relates to the first part with a lot of affordable housing coming there, what we'd like you guys to think about is potentially finding a way where we can, you know, ultimately mitigate 100% of this offsite with, with a payment, obviously, from us and finding a way that the city can, in the long run, that the city can utilize those dollars in a better way. And we'd like to get support from you guys um, 
when the time is right to, to find a way to make that work. So really just, you know, some food for thought at this point, but um, you know, we can pick this up at the next meeting with the further discussion, but we don't want to blindside you guys with, with all of this at once, the thought process, you know, between Jeff and myself, and unfortunately Jeff uh, uh, had a prior commitment right now that um, we like to give, give you guys the information so that we can have a fruitful discussion uh, when the time is right. Thank you, Jared. And just so we have a sense of planning, because we might want to have a little discussion about it so that we can give you some additional information as to what to be prepared mm -hmm. for in that conversation. What's your timeline? Because I know you've been talking to the IDA as well. Do you do you think you'd be back to us for our October meeting or are we looking at November? Absolutely. You would be. No, okay. October meeting. Yep. Okay. All right. So we should plan for that, Nels. Uh, that, that's going to think be a good discussion. And then um, I don't want to delve into it now, but if time permits, maybe at the end, we can maybe just brainstorm amongst the committee if there's any sort of considerations we want the team to take into account for that discussion, maybe. Um, you know, and obviously I'd love to hear what their outcome of the IDA conversation is as a result of that. I think we'll have a lot of influence. Right, and I know, you know, from our conversation last time, sort of everyone's got their own piece and some of this you guys touch, some of it you don't touch, but obviously, you know, I think this is a, this is gonna be an impactful project. For, for the overall area. So from our so seat on the development team, you know, we wanna make sure that everybody can buy into everything. And we're not trying to circumvent anything, you know, whatever you guys touch and whatever you guys don't touch, we still want your support um, throughout the entire project. Okay. Well, to, I think really appreciate Jared having a heads up because we wouldn't want to be, as yeah. you say, blindsided by that in October. Yeah, no, I thought it so, just, uh, I think I'd, give you guys a quick, uh, the quick update there. Right. And continue to keep us update, you know, in terms of what's happening with the Ithaca cause. I mean, I think getting them visible on the commons, that's certainly a very positive thing, I'm sure, for them. Yeah. And I think will be great for the commons merchants as well. And I, I'm not totally familiar with the ins and outs of this, but I assume that has no impact on property tax, even though they're a non-taxable entity right um yeah I, I don't believe it i don't believe it should because they're just leasing space they, just they leasing. will not own it um it's not right. even a triple net lease or a ground lease or anything like that they're effectively just leasing office space so that that should have zero impact on uh from a tax roll perspective okay great doug or leslie i mean just any kind of quick or charles if you're still there any kind of quick reactions we said jared has something to go away with um i think you know again if we have a little time at the end it might be worth brainstorming no, I appreciate the um, willingness to figure out a plan that's going to work for all the parties. You know, it remains to be seen if, in fact, we have a glut of affordable housing. I think a lot of people could argue we don't. But that said, if affordable housing can't be provided uh, affordably for the developer as part of this project, then what's the trade off that will be, be still a win for the community? And well, what I, what I, what all I wanted to you know, to give you guys some thought process was, we're not looking to shy away from the obligation, bring that to zero. What our thought process was, was A, we are bringing an affordable housing component to the city, uh, ultimately via two ways. Number one, we're gonna have a lease with Ithaca College for a large number of apartments in the building at a very favorable rate, which will allow those, the people that Ithaca College is bringing for this program to live at the commons, patronize the restaurant, spend time there, their entire life is going to be around that commons for, for the 18 months that each person is there. So I do think that that is a benefit to the overall area. The other piece of it is we are willing to, to obviously make a contribution into the fund. And our thought process was with the Vincino building going right next door, maybe the city can ultimately find a better way to utilize those dollars. And maybe there, there's another place in town or in the overall area that they want to see more affordable housing. And it's maybe it's not right on the commons. Maybe the answer is you do want it right on the commons and you guys will tell us, you know what, this is crazy. Just, just put it in the building. But our thought process was with the Fincino building having 200 plus affordable units right there, um, then maybe it makes sense for the affordable units that the city can, can put in place to be possibly somewhere else. I'm not a master planner, so I can't comment where those necessarily would be, but certainly, you know, I believe, I'm sure there are powers that be within the city that, um, you know, that has identified pockets of areas that could use additional housing. And one last clarification, Jared, on the IC program, and maybe you said it, and I just 
flew past me. The, the program is undergraduate or graduate? It is a graduate program. It is a brand new program. Um, it is uh, for physician's assistants. Yep. So they are in the process of getting, the college is in the process of being licensed for that. They've been working on this probably for a number of years. We've been talking to Ithaca, Ithaca College about locating that program in this building for, I don't know, probably at least nine months, maybe longer. Um, and obviously they've had their own pieces to go through. They were, I can tell you Ithaca College was very adamant about finding a way to put this downtown, whether it was with us or at another location, they were very adamant about finding a way to put this downtown to help patronize and, and continue to spur development and investment in the downtown area. And given the, the type of student that they're bringing here, graduate student, um, you know, little probably has a little bit more disposable income, can spend money around town. They were looking to obviously help spur the economy downtown with that, with those people. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Yeah, say, Doug, I see your hand, go ahead. So how many years is that program and how many participants would be in it on an annual basis? So I do, don't, don't hold me to this number because I'm definitely not the exact expert. Um, I believe it's an 18 month program um, with like basically admissions rolling every six months. So, you know, they're constantly bringing in a new class of, uh, of people. And I believe that they're trying to start it off with 60 participants and grow it from there. So following up, this might, like Doug's question, be something you don't have a perfect answer to, but do you know if IC's intention is to keep the program downtown long-term, yes. effectively they, like a satellite campus, yes, rather than are, putting it up the hill? They're signing a very long-term lease and investing a lot of money to build out this space. This is not a temporary home by any stretch. Interesting. Okay, cool. Thanks. Charles, anything? I noticed you. Uh, yeah, I just say um, it sounds like great news and thanks for the update and uh, exciting to have IC coming downtown. Um, I would just say from my point of view, the Vicino project and this project are two separate projects. So um, understand your point. And, uh, you know, I think folks have to figure out where, where the low income housing makes the most sense. But I would say that, you know, from my seat on the table, I want to see as much low income housing in all projects, uh, downtown and otherwise. So, um, you know, looking forward to seeing the update uh, next time when we get together. Uh, understood. Yeah, we definitely know that there are two distinct projects. Obviously, we have we don't control their site by any stretch, mm -hmm. but certainly, you know, I, the, the only reason I bring it up is, you know, per per the recommendation, maybe requirement of the city, we've been coordinating with them now for six, seven months. So while they are two distinct projects, you know, there has been a lot of cooperation on both sides so that the overall area can benefit. You know, the, it would be a shame if we were working in a silo and they were working in a separate silo without, you know, trying to coordinate for the betterment of the commons long term. Because for, from any project that we get involved in, my, my perspective is always, look, one plus one here might equal 11. Forget two, forget three. If we all work together, we can really make something great here. And that's that's always the goal in any project we get involved in, um, is to bring in as many voices as we can and work with as many other property owners as we possibly can. Yeah, sounds good, thanks. Great, thank you, Charles. Um, okay, I think that's good. Thank Jared for the update. Um, we'll look forward You're to welcome, we'll see you guys in a few weeks. Agenda. Yep, sounds good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next action item, which is the update on property leasing request from Ithaca Farmers Market Cooperative for lease concessions. And Jan Rhodes Norman is here as well. Nels, do you wanna just give us an overview and uh, highlights? Sure, yeah. So just a reminder that the um, for Steamboat Landing Site, the Ithaca Farmers Market leases that from the Ithaca Urban Renewal Agency who leases it from the city. And so, uh, the uh, farmer's market, like several of our lessees, has, is requesting some concessions uh, due to the COVID-19 impacts. And they have put, put together, they started talking with Tom Knipe at, at the city and uh, have developed that into a written request to the IRA. Uh, so you have a pretty substantial packet of information that Jan can go through. To cut to the chase here, the recommendation from staff is, is to recognize there has been an impact and provide a 50% discount for the full year's rent in 2020, which is similar to the way we've worked with Poltavari's landlord and, and Sinopolis's landlord. So recognizing there's some 
serious impacts there. Uh, those businesses were, had had mandatory closures, but uh, the farmers market has its own set of restrictions and requirements they've had to meet, which have been quite significant. So, the recommendation uh, in in this from the staff position is is a 50% uh, discount on the rent. The request is for a 75% discount. So maybe turn it over to Jan with that information. And Jan, we can share screen if you need if you want to uh, highlight anything. So um, I'm hoping that we can just go with what we already sent you because I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to, uh, to doing things like sharing screens. So I have, um, I have my hard copies in front of me and, uh, and you guys have, uh, I mean, there are some things that are more, um, maybe more informative than others. And uh, I, worked with uh, Becca uh, Rimmel, who was our executive director, former um, market manager, who has just recently handed in her re resignation. The year has been uh, a challenging year to be at the helm of the organization. Um, so there are lots of things that she sent you, including um, including a, a presentation that she did to the board and the membership uh, at our meeting a week ago, two weeks ago, that had uh, kind of a slideshow of what the general situation is that markets across the country are experiencing, um, as well as the Ithaca Farmers Market. Some of the um, little overview of some of the uh, issues that we've had to deal with this year, because obviously we've been uh, we've been tenants in that location since the mid 80s. And uh, my cat is trying to join the conversation. I'm going to put him down. Um, and in that time, we've always been timely in our payments. Really, from our beginning in the 70s, we've always been solvent and uh, have been in a growth pattern and have been able to make plans year to year. Uh, pretty much based on what we have experienced in the year prior. This year, we were doing our winter market because, um, because Green Star was moving. We weren't able to do it in the same location we had been in before. And we, uh, even though technically it wasn't in the city of Ithaca, we found a, a happy place up at Triphammer. And we were uh, in the atrium area outside of the shops, and it ended up being a very uh, a very positive thing for market and for Triphammer. But as we started to move into uh, the COVID time, they felt uh, increasingly uncomfortable having us up there. So uh, they weren't able to socially distance, and we quickly reassessed and moved down a month early to the pavilion. At the point that we moved down, it was when the health department was the most restrictive about how many people uh, could be in the pavilion, what kind of, you know, we were all pretty much, uh, as they say, building the airplane while we were flying it. And so we started off our season a few weeks early at the pavilion. And as we entered April, which over the years has gotten busier and busier to a point where we frequently have almost full occupancy of all 88 booths at the beginning of market. Because we needed to social distance, uh, the board made a decision with management that we were only going to be open for um, for 40 vendors to attend. So there were 40 booths that were filled and that meant that 48 booths were empty. And uh, it took a full month before we were able to allow, it was actually more than a month, about six weeks before we were able to bring back each booth. So that means that the beginning of the market, we had already lost a considerable amount of um, of income from our vendor fees. Uh, as we moved forward, there were some vendors who were uncomfortable with being down there for health reasons of their own. Uh, there were some vendors who were not allowed to attend because uh, initially it could only be essential 
businesses. And then when non-essential were able to attend, there were ag, New York State Ag and Market and Health Department rules that, uh, that had to do with food service. So a number of the food vendors were not able to actually start serving food for takeout only uh, until many months into the market season. And, uh, and so that kind of brings us to where we are now. It's a hybrid. We are running at about roughly 58% occupancy on Sundays and maybe 78% occupancy on Saturdays. So that's pretty unprecedented that we're not full during peak season in both times. And I think uh, it's clear to see from those pavilion rentals that were on that page that just uh, moved by that um, we had been, in terms of bookings, we had expected $65,000 in rental, which is uh, you know, a huge, without sticking all of our expenses to the vendors, it really is a boon to our budget to be able to rent the pavilion. As it turns out, they were all canceled for this year. Uh, and we, what we will remain having for the year is 2,925. And we had to refund two of them. Uh, most of the other ones we've been able to reschedule for 2021. The, that's great. Uh, the negative side of that is that that means that that money that we've gotten for deposits needs to be earmarked. It's about $71,000 needs to be held over in our available funds till next year. And that we won't have that influx of cash coming in next year. It will, it will already be, be sitting there as deposits for 2021. Um, the, we have been trying to do projections because we, have as we are in the middle of September, we pretty much are done with our season in terms of what we can expect for income. And, uh, you know, September, usually September and October, you can look at significant tourism that is not happening this year. And, uh, and many people are kind of winding down the season. So in terms of member fees, we don't anticipate uh, a large amount of income coming in uh, going forward. And as you mentioned, we had asked for 75% reduction in our rent. We have already paid 25% uh, for the year. And um, yeah, so I, rather than me continuing to talk, I should probably just ask if there are questions that, uh, that you have that I could answer. Oh, by the way, the last thing that I'll say is that we've been, since it's a moving target, you know, we're anticipating, we're trying to project forward based on what we've been experiencing. But of course, that can shift on a dime if, you know, we've had a few, even though we've been pretty rigorous in um, the, the um, requirements that we've had for how many people are in the pavilion, we've reduced the number by about 75%. Um, we have, you know, people have to wear masks, we have signage, we make announcements all the time, they're not allowed to eat in the pavilion. With all of that being said, the health department has received two complaints from people in the community. They came down and they observed, and uh, unfortunately it was the weekend that the students first came back and people standing in line were not social distancing to get into the pavilion and there was the biggest line that we'd seen since last year. And um, so we have uh, gotten a citation, a violation from the health department. And uh, so we're kind of sitting on the edge of our seats about that. So many things could change. And for that reason, uh, even though it, looking at our balance sheet, you can see that we do have the funds in our account to cover all of our expenses should there be no further income. Uh, the problem is that we know that 2021 is not going to be uh, a normal year. It's going to be, uh, I think cautiously you can say uh, that it's going to start with some, with some real spillover from where we are now. So we don't want to, um, we don't want to put ourselves in a tenuous situation. So we're trying to be judicious about keeping some money aside. 
So that's all I'll say for now. Perfect. Thanks, Jan, for the overview. And thanks for sending the really comprehensive packet in advance. Um, why don't we open it up for questions from the committee um, on either the program or the finances? Anybody? I had a question, and I don't know if this is actually for Jan or for Nels. Um, Nell, somewhere in your in the resolution, I think it suggested the fifty percent um, uh, grace and did and said nothing. I, I forget the exact wording, but it basically said no, uh, uh, nothing about a deferment. And Jan, in your original letter, I believe you you said that if seventy five percent forgiveness wasn't possible, a combination of forgiveness and deferment would be ideal. So my question is, since we're not proposing the full 75% forgiveness, Nels, is there any way that some deferment of the remainder could be rolled in, which doesn't sound like it was included? Am I correct in understanding that? Uh, you're correct that that my my recommendation did not did not include the deferment. I think actually the resolution is not quite correct because it said there was no deferment requested, but that was if there wasn't some discount provided. Um, given what Jan said, I'm not sure how a deferment really solves their issue if they're worried about the future year because really a deferment would take well, I don't know one of the quarterly payments and stretch it out over 12 months. But if 2021 is viewed as a you know, an uncertain year, I'm not sure that provides a lot of benefit. Uh, I thought the discount was a more significant uh, response than, than the deferment in this case, but certainly a deferment is a possibility to look at. Maybe Can I ask you, I was thinking if, if the 50% if the uh, forgiveness went through, would a deferment of the remainder be useful in any way? And I don't know what that would look like. And maybe Jan, you could say, yeah, it would be great or no, it wouldn't help at all. Um, well, that's that's a good question. I I hadn't thought of that. Um, I, you know, I know that when when Nels and Tom and I first spoke, my concern about um, because one possibility that was brought up to me was the idea of doing a deferment. And my concern with that was that it was almost like front loading our problems onto a year that we're anticipating will be um, difficult, uh, as, you know, as Nels mentioned. So, uh, you know, that, that could be, that could be helpful. Yes, it could be helpful to do, um, to do 50% of forgiveness and um, and the twenty five percent deferment to next year. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's we we are anticipating a a shortfall this year that ranges from around ninety two thousand dollars to one hundred and forty two thousand dollars, and you know, we have no idea where in that range things will fall. And I actually, uh, yeah, uh, Leslie, I just want to note that uh, the, we have received one payment of the four quarterly payments for rent. So, the, whereas the request was for 26,000 round numbers, the recommendation is for 17,000. So, there's about $8,000, $8,500 we're talking about that's not already factored in one way or another. Right. So, that's what I was trying to clarify too, Nels, because Jan said that they're currently current and we're obviously trying to create some sort of parity with the other lease agreements that we have. And so was the 50%, 50% of the remaining or 50% overall? 50% overall. Okay. So, so their going forward payment would be less than 50% because it would take into account that they've already paid something. Correct. At full value, right? Yeah. Okay. So these amounts that are on the resolved. So the rent due would be 17,438 but they've already paid a portion. So their actual payment due would be less than that. Right, it would no. be half of that. Uh, so maybe I'm misunderstanding. I thought, I thought that we owed, we had paid around 8,500. We right. owed 26. You were proposing 
50% of the total yearly payment, which was 17 something. And that would leave us with another payment of 8,500. And Leslie was asking if it was possible for that 8,500 to be deferred and the, the 55, the 50% 50 of the total as you had suggested would be forgiven. Is that, is that accurate? 8719 actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, yes, I should have that. Yeah. Yep. So an issue, an issue to consider here is that the city is the ultimate uh, bearer of, they receive the funds from the loan funds. It's, the IRA is really acting as a conduit mm -hmm. and the city has already developed a budget for this year of what their expected revenues are gonna be of which they factored in these lease payments. Um, they recognize that you know there are hardships out there and but they also have their shortfall. So um, I, I, I think a deferment would would some would, would crimp the budget a bit for the city, uh, you know, on top of the discount, just so it's, you know, understanding that they would expect some revenue from this lease and there would be the 8,700 that was received already, but there wouldn't uh, be any additional if, if that final quarter was, um, quarter payment was deferred to 2021. And speaking as uh, with, with another, I, you know, another hat on speaking as uh, a resident of downtown Ithaca for my business as well as my home. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fully aware of how pinched the city budget is and where the, where the income does come from in terms of property taxes and sales taxes and everything is down and Congress didn't pass any appropriations for cities. And, you know, so I, I think that I think that the market is fully aware that this does not come, it doesn't, this ask does not come without sacrifice um, on everybody's part. So, you know, we don't, we don't think that there is a, a bottomless pit where the city is concerned at all, we're aware. Yep. Uh, Doug, Charles, questions? The question about fundraising, what kind of fundraising efforts have been done to date and what are planned? Okay, so um, so that's actually an excellent question because we had been thinking of, before all of this happened, we had been thinking of doing um, kind of a large uh, capital campaign because we had received uh, a grant for the parking lot and work on the pavilion that would have required, um, you know, the next piece of it would have required a, a significant chunk of money. We part of it was a fifteen percent matching from from market, but we were we were anticipating doing um, doing a big campaign for that. And um, what ended up happening was we did a community. Uh, community fundraising campaign um, called, I think it was Market Heroes, asking people in the community to, um, to donate to help us defray the, um, the gap in our finances for this year. And what ended up happening was Ithaca Hummus uh, jumped in and offered to match money up to a certain amount, which was incredibly generous of them. They years ago got their start at the farmer's market. And um, so they, uh, we, the money that's in the budget there that was raised was from the fundraising that we did with them. And then I had applied for um, a PPP and we got some PPP money. So that is, um, that's reflected in there as well. My concern in terms of us trying to fill our shortfall this year by um, going back to the community and asking for, for more money is that I don't want to create donor fatigue for something really substantial that we're looking to do by 
being there with our handout repeatedly. So we did just do this fundraising uh, thing with Ithaca Hummus uh, about four weeks ago. So it's unlikely that we're going to be doing anything else soon. We have been exploring other possibilities, um, possibly looking to see if there's any sponsorship uh, from you know, larger businesses in the community. We, the only sponsorship that we've ever done before has been with Alternatives Federal Credit Union. They were sponsors of our Thursday evening market, but the evening market obviously did not happen this year because it's, it, it's all about live music and, uh, and food. And so, um, so that did not happen. And, and what's the plan and status for the winter market? Uh, it's up in the air. Uh, there is a committee that is looking at winter market to see um, to see where it's possible for us to do that. We are having some difficulty because um, because of the issue that I mentioned with mm -hmm. Trip Hammer. Most other places where you would be looking at an enclosed place, enclosed space with lots of people. Um, nobody is very excited about that. So it's a, uh, you know, I mean, we even at one point were thinking of the possibility of trying to do something down at the pavilion, but the pavilion fills with snow and, and it's, it's pretty uncomfortable down there. So it's, uh, it's being actively worked on. The farmers at this point have really come to depend on that for their livelihoods, not just the farmers, food vendors, um, and certainly the community has really, over the years, come to see that as a really important uh, part of their, their local food system. Yeah, okay. So I feel like we're in a bit of an awkward position because it's ultimately like we're the go-between here. Um, of course. <laughs> And so we're, whatever we decide, we have to, I guess, get the city to approve. And I, I'd obviously, I think none of us want to totally bind the city's hands. Um, but I, I mean, I'm certainly, I think, you know, at a minimum, we should do the same thing we're doing with Cultivari and with Cinemopolis's rents. Um, I do think your idea is interesting, Leslie. Again, you may not totally solve the farmer's market problem in 2021, but I think our resolution already indicates that we're willing to continue to look at this into 2021 once all of us have more certainty, right? Isn't that what it says? Um, right. Right. Uh, I just lost that on my page here. And, right? and given, given that we had our expectation coming into this meeting was based on the resolution that you, that you had written out, Nels. So we were we were coming into this meeting thinking that that what you were recommending and what obviously you do not have the power to to grant it has to be the city um but we were we were anticipating the 50 percent which would still leave us with the 25 percent payment due for this year so that that was that was our expectation okay just a quick clarification there. Actually, the way the leases are structured, uh, we do believe that if the mayor supports it, it doesn't need to go back to Common Council. Oh, okay. Uh, the, decision, the decision can be binding. Okay. Okay. So, all right, that simplifies things slightly. Okay. Um, so I don't Bonte, know. Leslie... Has he heard about this at all? Has he had any indication that we're asking for this? Yeah, he's tracking this. I mean, it will it will need to move whatever this recommendation is from the committee. We'll need to go to the full IRA where the where the mayor will chair that meeting. Right. Right, and that'll be next week. Right. Lost yeah. track of my yes. date. But Correct. Then, yes, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So we can get a quick resolution on that. Okay. So, Leslie, I, I, did you do you want to suggest that as a motion for us to consider? It would be an amendment to what's in the packet. No, not at all. I wanted to just explore the idea because it seemed like a com combination of forgiveness and deferment hadn't been really considered. And um, I think, you know, Nell's point that it binds this or it could be ch challenging for the city 
without really putting giving much additional advantage to the farmers market it just puts off the payment a few months um so yeah i i am perfectly happy to uh put it that idea aside now that we've had a chance to think through what it would look like yeah i mean i could Unless argue, somebody I could, else I, feels it should be pursued yeah i mean i could also argue with the other way around which is the eight thousand dollars or eight thousand and change that we're sort of talking about is meaningful to both organizations, but as a percentage of budget, it's much more meaningful to the farmer's market than it is to the city. And again, as a taxpayer, it matters to me too. So like, we're all taking it from one pocket and sticking it in another and essentially, or it's in neither pocket is really the problem, <laughs> Yeah. right? So, um, so it depends on which lens, I guess we want to look at it through. Um, obviously it matters a lot to the city as well. I guess I would argue that uh, continuing a deferment or not a deferment a this reduction in rent for 2021 would be better than deferring this year's till next year right so you're proposed so like a 50% for 2020 and a 50% for 2021 that would be my suggestion would be, real, would be real dollars right is it premature to offer a deferment of that substantial magnitude for 2021 already I mean, clearly we're open to it, but maybe should we wait and see at least how part of 2021 rolls out? You know, the farmer's market is a beloved institution uh, and I think very important to our tourism economy and whatnot. I think if, uh, if this would help stabilize uh, their operations, knowing that for 2021, which we know already is going to be very challenging economically, I would say let's include it. I mean, the advantage to me of that, Doug's suggestion is, yes, no, none of us know exactly the depth of how difficult 2021 will be, but we know it's not going to be business as usual, at least certainly for the winter market and probably at least the first part of the summer season. And you know, to me, the advantage is it gives farmers market a little bit more clarity in terms of their two year financial planning, right? So what are they gonna do this year to stabilize? How do they then take that into next year? At least they know what this fixed cost line item is gonna be, right. right? Otherwise then they have to come back at some point in the spring and we're talking about it. And then, you know, again, amidst all the uncertainty, it doesn't prevent, I guess you guys coming back, Jan, if things are really cratering but at least I would think giving you a little financial clarity for two years is easier than trying to plan just for the next six months. Well, I won't deny that, that, that absolutely <laughs> true. Nels, does yeah. that fly? Are, are we uh, in a position to offer that given that it's quite a ways out? Uh, I think technically I, we are. Um, we did structure the lease payment to to kind of coincide with the season of the market. So I think the first lease payment is due in June. I think it's like June, August, September, November. So there is some time before there would be a first lease payment due in 2021. Uh, if you wanted to wait to see what was gonna happen, but that doesn't give a, you know, that doesn't give any certainty for budget planning. Um, so I think you, you, you could recommend that and see where it goes with the IRA uh, and, the, and the mayor. Well, I guess I would move it with that amendment. All right, is there a second? I'll second that. I'll second that. All right, Charles snuck it in there. So Doug, Very on the motion. I'm paying attention. <laughs> Darn you, Charles. <laughs> Can we flip back to being able to see everybody? Yeah, uh, that would be great, actually, Charles. Uh, if you could unshare the screen. Um, is there any other discussion, including from you, Jan, if you have anything else to add? No, I, I certainly, I appreciate everybody's support of the, of the farmer's market and, um, and, you know, hopefully we will, we will all exceed this year and next year what, what our current projections are, but I, you know, I, I think it really in addition to all of the things that we're struggling through, I think it uh, it definitely could ease things a lot, um, being able to to count on this. So thank you for the vote of confidence and hopefully the 
IURA will be um, be supportive of it as well. Cool. All right. Uh, if there's no other discussion, uh, we'll take a vote on the resolution as amended by Dodger Amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And Charles? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. So that's unanimous. Great. Thank you, Jan, for coming in. Continued uh, support for everything you guys are trying to do. Thank you very much. And thank you, Doug, for the suggestion of 2021. That's incredibly helpful. Jan, yeah. can I, before you disappear, can I point out that you have Kiva support too? I don't know if you <laughs> noticed, but right when you came on, she walked up the stairs behind me. Oh, great, yeah. great, good. <laughs> well, I do, I do appreciate that. You know, I love Kiva. <laughs> okay, thank you very cool. much. Thanks, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that good discussion. And thank you, Doug and Leslie, for thinking outside the box. All right, let's move on then. We have a loan application as well for a new or a consolidation and expansion of a business on the commons, which is exciting considering that all the stuff we've dealt with in the last few meetings to talk about something new is good. Um, so Nels, again, you wanna give us an intro and then um, I think the applicant is here as well, right? Yeah, Scott is still here, I believe. Uh, yep, okay. Yep, so we have a loan request for $100,000 for a new retail business on the commons, which is, a, as you described it, it's, it's not an easy thing to describe. It's basically taking the Breathe store that is currently in Santa Ithaca, moving it across the hallway to the 15 space, 15 step space, merging them together, adding in a cookware component uh, to that, as well as a craft, uh, a, a, a uh, uh, kind of a, a display, a, a kitchen where you can do cook, cooking shows as well as a craft room in the back. So they're really trying to identify multiple revenue sources. Uh, the big change from earlier discussions that uh, Scott brought forward was, was the integration of 15 steps, which I think really strengthens the overall project. So it would be, I think as described in the loan uh, analysis as an imperium with multiple uh, components to it, uh, 15 steps, uh, it was in the process of retiring and looking for a buyout. So that's part of this project. And I think it will be branded. Uh, they'll try to play up the 15 steps brand name and their very loyal customers of, I don't remember how many years they've been open, 35 or something like that. Almost 40. Uh, so 40, almost 40, according to Scott. So uh, the, you know, but as a as a downtown retail business, uh, it's a tough environment, and it's not made easier by having a pandemic uh, raging out in in the process. So, the loan analysis has come to the conclusion that this is a solid project. Uh, that the uh, it's a wisely developed approach, we think, and there is a debt coverage ratio that is reasonable. It's 1.21 in year one, and increases thereafter if they can hit their revenue targets. We're happy to see that the revenues that they projected in early years do take into account uh, COVID-19 pandemic impacts. So they're not, you know, padding. They're not expecting that 15 Steps is going to replicate their sales, you know, next you know next year because they realize it's a it's a tough market, um, and they've really made you know a plan to try to reduce overall expenses by merging these businesses together under one roof and minimizing staff costs. So there's there is a series of financing for the project that primarily is working with M&T as the primary lender. The IRA would come in as a second lender on, on this project. All the collateral would be pledged to M&T. The IRA would take a second position on the collateral, which is really the inventory. Um, but there is very strong personal financial guarantees available for this to secure the loan. So primarily, if things were not to work out as projected, um, we would be relying on the personal guarantees of uh, the owners, uh, Carol Travis and and uh, Todd Now. So that, that gives us some comfort that those are st strong positions. This is a critical area of the of the commons in the downtown to keep vital with with retail kind of businesses that people want to visit or or go or you know both ba basically appeals to both locals and and travelers. Uh, and it, it really is a core kind of location uh, that we think is important to have a retail storefront in and it's supportive of our prior priority business loan program that recognized the need for foot traffic and retailers, not just restaurants and vape shops and the commons, I guess. 
Um, so we're recommending that the loan be approved uh, at our, our normal three and a half percent interest rate, dropping down to two and a half upon meeting the job creation and retention goals. Essentially, I want to be clear that there is some job retention here and job creation. Um, Breathe is not in a position to continue to operate uh, for the long term under the current conditions. So there would be two jobs lost if, if they can't find a way to make this a, a bigger project. Uh, and then there's one projected new job out of uh, in the retail. So a total of three jobs, uh, which meets our standard of $35,000 per job for the $100,000 loan. Uh, and I think that is the, the quick review from, from us. I think it was a very thorough uh, loan analysis we worked on with, with Harry Sickerman's uh, company to, to develop it, but it certainly opened any questions. And I think Scott would be better at describing the project than I could. Yeah, Scott, do you want to take a minute, if anything, you want to add to Nels's opening? Sure. I think uh, Nels pretty much summed it up. Um, the idea being because retail fashion has taken a hit nationwide, there's just, there's no help for that situation. Uh, that being said, we are still doing some steady business from unexpected quarters. Uh, our tourism kind of uh, was a little higher than expected. Uh, the local consumers, not so much, at least during the uh, peak uh, numbers of the uh, uh, of the COVID. Uh, and now that I, I see that the numbers are going back down, I'm seeing a little more encouraging signs uh, after our flurry that occurred up on the hill there. Uh, the project is essentially the merging of two business. We'll be moving Breathe from our current space over into what used to be the tourist space and opening the walls in between. So we're going to be incorporating women's fashion, the 15 steps model, which is American made handcrafted uh, jewelry, gifts, artwork, uh, pottery and cookware. We're gonna be expanding on their lines because I think there's a, a huge untapped market in there. It's one of the leading directions right now in retail. Uh, I will say that 15 step sales have been exceptionally strong, much stronger than we initially anticipated when we first started planning this back in May uh, was when I really first started seriously looking at the numbers and Betsy had come back to me, Betsy Park, one of the owners of 15 Steps, had come back with some coldly realistic numbers that have since proved uh, to be far lower than what they actually did. So they're operating at darn near close to 80% of last year's business, and which is impressive. And people still have birthdays, they still have engagements, they still have anniversaries, they still need gifts. Uh, they have since pumped up a considerable portion of their website and they've increased their traffic there. And they've done some really interesting things with the shop by numbers in the window where you can walk by and look at a number on something, order it over the phone and have it delivered. And it's been very successful and very well received. And we're gonna to continue to capitalize on these trends and at the same time incorporate fashion, expand on their uh, cookware and housewares element and then put in a demo kitchen. And I have a number of exceptionally talented chefs and caterers who've all expressed uh, enormous excitement about being a part of it and are willing to come down and offer classes. I, we've also gotten a num uh, considerable feedback from I think every banker in town looking for entertainment for VIPs when they come in town. So uh, the overall public response has been very strong. Uh, we're also going to be incorporating a crafting classroom because this just furthers the mission of handcrafted that 15 steps is built. Now we're going to add an experiential haptic component to the whole thing. And I have a number of craft instructors all lined up, all ready to jump in as soon as we are, as soon as we're ready to do it. Uh, we're in the process of working with uh, M&T and they've been diligently plugging along on that. And uh, that's why we're coming to IURA to kind of help us with this expansion uh, once we actually acquire 15 steps. Great, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, let's open it up for discussion then amongst the committee. Questions? I have a question that Nels, you can probably clarify about the number of jobs. I understand two retained, that's from um, Breathe, 
and one new position created. But what I'm not totally clear on is where did the jobs from 15 steps go? Are we not counting the previous jobs there because 15 steps technically has now closed? So those jobs are just lost and they're not in the equation? Essentially, yes, that's correct. I mean, and, and plus, I, I believe most of the jobs were the owners. I don't know whether they were employees or owners. So they, you know, we don't count. Uh, and if you're not on the payroll, it doesn't count for CDBG job purposes. But you're right, we are a little bit isolating and looking at this, you know, as as one business. Um, it is clear that 15 steps was planning to retire. They were there was, it's not as if they were like, you know, Scott approached them and said, would you want to sell? Um, they were gonna they were gonna retire is our understanding. So I think those jobs would have been lost in in any event if not for uh, this project. Got it. Um, and I guess a follow up question about jobs, Scott. This question would be for you: um, Is the sort of logistical and administrative management of the kitchen and the craft space going to be tackled by yourself and other employees? And the folks who come in and teach classes are going to be basically renting the space is that how that will operate no they'll be 1099 uh the space the the space will be uh part of home cooking ithaca dba 15 steps and then we'll be having instructors come in that are just paid per class uh to teach so everybody uh yeah, maybe everybody doesn't know what a 1099 is. Um, that means they're going to be independent contractors working for, they won't count as employees, but they're going to be independent contractors. Right. And then we will have three full-time employees. In addition to that, uh, we've lined up uh, Tish McGrath from Mockingbird Papery, who has uh, considerable experience down on the commons, and she knows and loves the business well. And she has agreed to come back, uh, God willing, October 1st. Uh, to handle because 15 steps does get significant traffic where it is a minimum of a two man job, uh, three man on a busy day, man or woman, excuse me. I think the, uh, the kit demonstration kitchen idea is a fantastic idea. I was kind of disappointed that Cultivari, which I thought was going to appeal more to uh, consumers doesn't seem to be doing that at all and I've been in many places that that has been a major draw in the evenings or weekends for tourists or locals on a variety of things so how many people would be able to fit in the, the class for the demo cushion in your current design where we're putting it is currently in the back of what used to be the storeroom for cap you remember the gallery space was in the uh, west side of the back half. And then there was a partition wall, a non-supporting partition wall with a drapery and a huge store area behind that. So the kitchen will fit back in there and it will be the, it's a typical galley kitchen style with an open uh, counter towards the main room. So that room is large enough we can handle. Pre-COVID my numbers were anywhere from 12 to 14 people in that space. Uh, the numbers that I submitted for this application, we took that into account and scaled it back to half. So I can fit four couples, everybody masked. You still have some room for social distancing. There's ventilation in there. Uh, so it, it worked out. And for the craft area, pretty much everything we do is masked already. Uh, and there's plenty of room for social distancing in there. I would never take on more than eight to 10 people at a class ever anyway, and there's plenty of room and space for that. And what do you envision the fee for a typical culinary class? Do you have any sense of that yet? Yeah, I've actually been discussing it with a few people. Um, it's a, a bit of a sliding fee because it depends primarily on what we're gonna be presenting based on the ingredient costs. But by and large, you're gonna be looking at the children's classes anywhere from 15 to $20 a session uh, for the adult classes around 45 and that provides you with an hour and a half of fun entertainment chatter and uh, a nibble of food not a full meal but you're getting a good sized portion of whatever it is that's being prepared. Okay. 
And that could go up depending on if we do something a little more expensive, a little more fancy. I have Marsha Patitucci Waffner, who's a, a fabulous Italian chef, and she works with truffle oil occasionally and things like this. So things could get a little bit pricier. So some of the ones I've been to like that, uh, where they would sort of do a demo dinner and then you'd have a sit down dinner afterwards. Obviously you don't have space for that in the current configuration. Does the back side of, I guess that would be the, uh, the south side there open up into the big atrium of the commons there or the center? Uh, that room, what used to be the CAP offices, is going to become the craft classroom. We'll also use that for first fa uh, Friday gallery exhibits uh, mm -hmm. and anything of that nature. I've also had a number of discussions with some of the other vendors around here. Greta from uh, Alphabet Soup has wanted to do children's story hour for quite a while, things like this. So she may come in and rent the space for a nominal fee just to also do things like that. We won't be able to do sit down dinners because technically we are not a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I don't have an Ansel hood. Everything is no open flame, induction heat, recirculating uh, air filters with carbon filters and uh, HEPA filters. Uh, you'll still get a good size taste right. and then probably be able to go out for a snack afterwards. Any other questions? None for me. Okay. All right, did someone want to move uh, approval? Or, I was give, uh, given an opportunity for others to do it, but I will if nobody else does. Doug, and I saw Leslie's hand, thank you. So Doug, moving it, Leslie seconding. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor then? Aye. Yeah, that's Aye. unanimous. Thank you, Scott. Good luck on the next steps. And um, we'll take this to the IRA committee or full board next week. Okay, awesome, wonderful. Thank you all, everyone. Great, thank you. Have a good day. Yep. Chris, you said good luck on the next steps. Did you mean the 15 steps? Exactly, the next 15 steps. <laughs> exactly. I thought about it as it was coming out of my mouth too. Yeah, I'm so witty. <laughs> the um, yeah, the sixteenth step. Um, <laughs> okay, Nels, let's um, let's do the review of the financials and um, and uh, staff report. Yeah, I don't have the the loan report due because our accountant was busy with other work and uh, needed a couple of days off, so we only have the lease report right now. The 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 big picture in the loan report is everybody is current except for you know our, our perennial we're still trying to collect on on the massage school so we're, we're in good stead with the loans many of them you know some of them are on deferrals um, but they're all current with those deferred payments as you can see in the lease report we have a number of past due but again that was a snapshot in time since then all of those leases are now current um, we're still working with uh, Cougar Green LLC which is the landlord to Cultivari and uh, Sinopolis, uh, they are, um, they did just make another payment and we're negotiating another month of a 50% 50, 50 discount. So that'll be for Sinopolis, um, May through September, 50% discounts. Uh, the April payment due was, was a deferral until next year. So that's, that's, you know, to put that in context with the other ones that or our prior uh, gin item. Cultivari is only, I believe, asked for two months of discounts. Um, so, you know, we've been responding to the requests and working with the landlord. So, uh, again, our policy has been if the landlord provides that discount, then we would also provide a discount to the landlord. So, those, those look in good stead, uh, generally speaking, and we will continue to work with each of those. I did just get a request from uh, State Theater of Ithaca for a, they had a six month deferral where they were paying interest only. And given that they are not allowed to be open, they've asked for another six month extension. The IRA passed a resolution back in March, granting that authority to automatically ap uh, approve deferrals during the COVID emergency period if they were considered reasonable. And I um, 
I confirmed with them that they can continue to make their $550 interest only payments. So uh, based on that original approval, um, I will work to extend that since they are not in a position to, to be generating any income, they are mm -hmm. still waiting for the authority to open. Uh, a couple of other, other updates here is that uh, the ownership of LAG, better known as the Rook Restaurant, is looking to have an ownership change. Uh, one of the owners wants to buy out the other owner. Uh, and so they're asking for a uh, um, removal of some of the collateral that was offered by the owner who's being bought out by the other owner. So that will be coming forward to you probably in the October meeting. Um, they will be looking for release of some collateral that loan was originally $40,000, now paid down to $15,000. So it's been a very successful uh, loan for the IRA. Uh, and they've been working in a, uh, you know, really stabilizing that West State Street corridor area. So it's been positive. Uh, we've talked with the developer who was a, anointed as a preferred developer for the Inlet Island uh, urban renewal project that we talked about last month. He is committed to provide written communication to the for the October meeting about their plans so we can understand what their position is. Uh, generally speaking, it sounds like they're very interested in submitting a proposal for consideration for redevelopment uh, on Inlet Island. Uh, and the other bit of news I have is that uh, the, we just received word a half hour ago, maybe it was an hour ago, that we have received our second tranche of CDBG COVID funding. So. We have $367,000 award, which translates to about $300,000 for projects that we can utilize for uh, activities uh, to address COVID related issues. So that's good news to have some more resources in the community because we also received word that the county has proposed to, uh, the county's proposed budget um, zeroes out the community outreach worker program uh, for funding, which has uh, been a pretty uh, successful program to engage with people in the downtown area and the homeless population and go to do outreach at the jungle. And it would be a shame to lose that resource. <clears throat> um, so that might be one area to want to take a look at. Uh, so those are the uh, staff staff updates that I had for you and uh, happy to answer any questions you have. I, the, other, the other thing I should note is that the uh, New York State DOT facility site next to the farmer's market was uh, auctioned off today, or at least they were holding an auction. I don't know whether there was any successful bidder or not. There was a minimum price of $2.8 <laughs> million. So that's uh, what I was going to ask you. It was just this afternoon. So we don't uh, have any news? No, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, but I had a conflict with this meeting, so I, I wasn't able <laughs> to go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I do have a contact. It, uh -huh. <laughs> Please. I do have a contact at the state and I will today. be asking them. Yep. Today, one o'clock. <laughs> so you missed it unless they call it back. So uh, I'll try to find out what the outcome of that auction is and uh, report to you about that as well. Assuming they didn't get bids at $2.8 million, you think they would come back to the city to negotiate something less or? Uh, they might, uh, what uh, my guess would be that they would try a, another approach, maybe with setting a lower minimum or maybe doing some sort of a, an RFP approach, you know, process or an option agreement rather than, I think one of the concerns um, was that uh, the auction is final. You have to pay for the, you know, you don't you pay for it and it's yours. Uh, and, you know, then you have to think about, can the soil support the building I want to build? Will the planning board support it? What about, you know, in and out traffic on a one, you know, everybody has to go on third street to get in and out of the site. So I think there was some concern about that. The biggest concern I think from development community was there's two large projects already in the works, you know, a Carpenter Business Park site and uh, and City Harbor across the way so that those projects are gonna get into the market first. Uh, and they're, you know, they're all, they're, they're all both those projects include a mix of medical and housing uses, which is, um, you know, may not may not leave a lot of new demand to be able to be soaked up at that site in the short term anyway. So we'll see. Uh, last word we had is there were seven to nine bona fide serious bidders planning to attend the meeting, the, the auction. Car dealership. <laughs> not, it's not. 
<laughs> uh, sorry, that's not an allowed use in the waterfront district. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for the staff report, Nels. Uh, other topics anyone wants to just make sure we cover? I've got one thing about the next meeting that I just wanted to just raise. Nels, what's that development that's going on on East State Street uh, right up for the tuning fork there? Um, I'm not sure if I know what's going on, what, what, what physical activity you see. There is a, there is a I, I guess I do know what it is. It's, it's, it's uh, now that you mention it, uh, the city is rebuilding and stabilizing the retaining wall that holds up East State Street. Huh. So they have to do a lot of invasive work to get that ready. Uh -huh. It's not uh, structurally sound any longer, or at least it has some challenges. Uh, yeah. However, there is a developer interested in trying to integrate with that. So the owners of Gateway are working with another developer to see if they can uh, integrate a project into that site on the parking lot down below. Um, so there may be some components of each of those things going on. It's essentially a retaining wall project, but it may be a retaining wall project plus more in terms of some of the investment to support a future development project. And if whatever development is going on there, I know that there was the, a little trail along the creek there. Would that be sort of protected or included in whatever development there is? There? Yeah, we call that we call that the Winter Village Trail. I don't know if it's an accurate name or not, but um, that would that is a, on the city's. The city has a, holds a right of way for that trail. Mm -hmm. It also has where the water line goes underneath there. So there's also an easement kind of issue okay. as well. And the city has is, is been for years searching for additional grant funds to try to extend that to go further up Six Mile Creek to extend right. that, that route. Um, there, the plan to extend it requires three bridges. You have to cross over the, the river like two <laughs> or three times because you run yeah. out of, you know, embankments come up right to the water edge. Right. Well, that's good to know. Uh, I do, you know, that would be a really special trail going from downtown up along the creek there if we could get right. There's a there's a, a in the middle term there's a project to upgrade the water supply system from the drinking water source up by um, you know, first dam or whatever second dam, yeah. uh, and the I, the hope is that somehow when that pipeline gets rebuilt or repaired or whatever we do that we could then utilize that as the base for for a walking trail. Okay. That's cool. Um, we have a meeting on Thursday, on Tuesday, 13th of October. Um, I have a conflict until four o'clock. Um, I'm happy to have you guys start for half hour without me, but it sounds like we have a media agenda. Um, I could also start at four if people were amenable to that. Rather than changing the date, I would hate to change the date. Not a problem on my side. Four you see October fourteen. Be the thirteenth, uh, Charles. 13th. Tuesday the thirteenth, and I'm proposing four o'clock instead of three thirty. Or you guys start at three thirty, and I just join half hour in. That's fine with me. Or alternatively, if there are things that don't require a quorum, or if Nels, you could do the staff report uh, at the beginning, or you know anything like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know if we'd have an hour of of non. Uh, well, it'll be a half hour. Non acting items. Um, Three thirty to four. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll likely have um, some a couple of items, but I don't I don't the big item I think really is going to be the discussion with uh, Rothschild's mixed use development project. Mm -hmm. So it would be best to have everybody involved in that discussion. But yeah, we could probably figure out close to a half hour of action. Um, well, Speaking of which, uh, sorry, I just looked up physician's assistance. That's a three-year program, master's program. That's what I thought it was too. <laughs> he said 18 months ago. Uh, it might be that some of it is out in the field though. I'm not sure if it's all at a classroom yeah. setting. Yeah. Well, I'm fine if you guys start at 3.30, handle the financials and the staff report, and if all three of you are there, there's a quorum. So you can certainly start on official business if you want to put the Ross Shelby development project a little later. And so it starts after I arrive. I'm mm -hmm. fine with that. I'd hate to miss the 
meatiest item of the right meeting. so we should confirm that, that that looks like we have a quorum for that meeting on the 13th at 330 because if if Chris is late okay Charles is a yes yeah okay so then yeah we can go for 330 so Doug if you would chair for till I arrive or chair for the whole thing it's fine either way 30 minutes I can do it <laughs> <laughs> awesome it's at your maximum cool all right any other business uh, do you want me to ask the developers of Rothschild for a, a proposal of what they propose, you know, so yeah. that there's something to respond to? Because they kind of like talk in circles sometimes. <laughs> it's hard to know. And where I, think, at. <laughs> I think what we're going to keenly want to know is yeah, what are they leasing these apartments out to the college at? Right. So they're coming to us saying the financials don't work to get 20% but clearly they've negotiated some sort of long-term deal with the college at what sounds like it's below market. Um, uh -huh. So <laughs> I'd like to understand what those economics are and how it affects the overall economics of the project and so on. Because, okay. right? Because the case that's gonna have to be made to the public and to the common council is that, I mean, I mean it's the, the, the optics of, the, of that is the, the risk is that the <clears throat> Common Council will be concerned that in lieu of affordable housing for workforce, we've got affordable housing for graduate students, which is subsidized by a lower rent to Ithaca College. So I think understanding the full economics of the package is gonna be helpful for us to understand, understand whether or not the in lieu payment that they might be proposing is a is a good trade off overall for the community. Right. Yeah. In in putting, can you guys hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. In in putting it back to them and asking them for a proposal, Nels, I would say that we started out with twenty percent affordable housing, and they've talked about a lot of different things. Um, and the conversation was nice today, but I agree with Chris. I'd like to see the financials that show why they should move off the 20%. So I think our negotiating position is to hold the line and for them to make a quantitative argument, not a qualitative one, but a quantitative argument about why they're coming off 20%. So um, I just hold the line and see what they say because then they'll negotiate against themselves in the process of making that argument back to us. So let's just see what they have to say. So can I ask for a clarification? My recollection may be wrong. I thought that the initial requirement was 10% and the 20 came up with um, the, oh, there comes my dog again, back down the stairs, um, that that was a, um, an IDA requirement. Is that not? Yeah, that, that's so? my understanding too, is that it, the 20% was about the IDA with the tax benefit. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really know why they're still Making they the, should still be at 10, but, no? I, well, well, they and seem we, to think yeah. it's 20. So in my mind, if they think it's 20, let's see what they can do to come off 20. I mean, yeah. it's, it's all kind of perception more than anything. Well, the 20%, we had always said 20% was a goal, but we required yeah. 10, right? And then the IDA came in and said, well, it's 20. Oh, right? okay. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. And that was the discussion last meeting, right? And then they were like, they were looking to us to say, well, we yeah. can't do 20. Like, well, it's not up to us. And we said, go go talk to the IDA. Right. And if they still feel like they owe us 20, let's see what they have to say. But there's no going yeah. below 10. Is that correct? 10 is hard limit? That's what our disposition development agreement says, is 10 and, is a minimum. And it sounded to me that what he was suggesting today is that they want to make a proposal to pay for having that 10% be off-site. Right, they wanted to do an in lieu fee payment. I, it sounded like a contribution to the Community Housing Development Fund. Okay, five uh, million dollars. <clears throat> right, and if they apply, if, <laughs> if, if uh, based on the IDA's policy, if they were to strictly just thinking about the IDA and not about the IRA, uh, they can meet their workforce housing policy with a one million dollar contribution. You know, it's it's five thousand dollars per unit, so it's. 200 units, that's five, uh, that's a uh, million dollar contribution to the Community Housing Development Fund would meet the IDA requirement. Um, I think where they are right now going into the IDA is they're expecting a 10% commitment in the site, on the uh, on site to meet the 
IRA requirement and then a $500,000 payment into the community housing development fund is kind of the starting point for their discussions with the IDA. And they feel that that would meet both the IRA and the IDA's requirements. But I think they're also trying to lay the groundwork to say that that's not financially feasible for them without showing us financials. <laughs> so I think we need right. to see the financials. It's, a, it's the core. Right, because if they're conceding anything to IC, why are they not able or willing to concede to the community? Yeah, and I would make the point in that IC seems really great for them and it's really great for the community as well. But part of why IC is down there is because of the amenities of the overall community, which is supported by all the work that a whole bunch of different parts of the community do. So, you know, if if they want to come off our our goal, then show us some quantitative numbers about why they can't do that. Right, and I think they should be marketing the facts. What that Chris pointed to is that property tax revenues derived, you know, because IC could invest in their own property and it could be tax exempt as a not for profit, but because they're agreeing to be a lessee and a for-profit owned project, that means there'll be more property taxes. They should be identifying for us that benefit, or at least to the IDA. It's, yeah, it we're gets, really more focused on the housing. I think it gets really complicated in a big hurry because, you know, there's the parking garage and the whole thing gets like, there's a community benefit there, but like, look at the loan that we all just approved, right? So that's a nice benefit for downtown for like living there and for uh, VIPs coming to the area and all different kinds of things. <laughs> so like, that's part of how they get a market rate long-term lease from one of our largest employers. And so I think what the community is looking for is, you know, low-income housing in every project. And so if they want to step off that, uh, show us the numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would just suggest, I mean, it like, seems like the last couple of times they've been pretty loosey-goosey with our time here. Seems like, uh, yeah. you know, if they have a proposal, bring the proposal or send it to us at a time. Don't waste our time. Okay. Mm -hmm. I concur. Good comments all around. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Nels, can I yep. stay on with you just to chat for about something totally unrelated for five minutes since we have a, a connection? Sure. A connection, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, we'll try to we'll try to stop the the live streaming on YouTube though. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, we can turn that off. <laughs> Let me turn that off. Sure. That's when it was on. All right, uh, bye, bye everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Uh,